Okay, so as I just said, we're going to do lectures 9 and try to get 10 or most of 10 done today. Um, what we're going to cover today is stuff you guys know about already in Java and insert other languages here if you know other languages. This includes loops, yay, um, and functions, creating your own functions. Uh, there's just the, the differences between the two that you really need to know. However, at first I'm going to cover a few other odd items. Um, which is, the first one is running commands in sequence. If you want to run two commands, one after another, whether it's two programs, a program and a script, in other words, you want to run one after another, shove a semicolon between them. That means you can, when it's done, it runs command two. So for, uh, an example of that would be if you want to move a bunch of files, or you want to copy a bunch of files, then you want to delete them. Or you want to move one bunch of files to one place, move a bunch of files to another place. You can really move files A to B, A, B, C to one location. Then you tell it move files D through G to somewhere else. B but you put it all on one command line instead of running two separate commands. You can just type it all up and let it go. Um, an example I use of this is when I'm restoring a database from backup. Um, especially if I'm replacing one that's already existing. So you'll have the first command, which is drop DB. Um, you know, flight DB, for example, I guess you know what that one is from last term. So drop DB, flight DB, semicolon, create DB, flight DB, semicolon, and then the PG restore command to pull it in. So one line will drop the database, create the database, and reload it. So instead of, so I can just hit enter and walk away and just let it do its magic without having to think about it too much because it's taking care of it on its own. Uh, if you want to run Two commands, but the second one is only allowed to run if the first one succeeded, you use double ampersands. So unless it returns zero, which is successful, if it returns anything but zero, it doesn't run the second command. If it returns an exit status of zero, it'll run the second command. Um, and as typical, if double ampersand is and, you can do or. Um, if the first program failed, then you want to run the second program. It's literally double pipe. So it's a funny use of the and and the or that you guys are used to seeing in other languages. But essentially double pipe means run second program if the exit code is anything but zero. Um, a single ampersand means that it runs the first command in the background. And while that one's running in the background, it'll run the second command. So you can run two commands at the same time. So you can copy a bunch of files. It's going to take an hour to copy, send it to the background, and then run another command while that one's running. So um, it's a bit like in Windows where you can go and open up a folder, copy some files, paste them somewhere else. And while it's copying, you can copy some more files and put them somewhere else and let them run in parallel. This one here, you have to explicitly tell it to go to the background, which is a single ampersand. Now, sometimes you have a script and you want your script to actually make its variables available to another script. Um, so for example, you have a script that creates a user and after the user is created successfully, you have another script that runs that actually builds their skeleton of their home folder. Maybe there's certain mount points that need to be created automatically. Uh, certain files need to be put in place in there, like an employee manual, their benefits booklet, that kind of stuff. And But you need to keep track of what the person's home path would be. Um, there's a command called export. So if you go export space, the name of the variable, it is now available as an environment variable. So you know in Java, when you messed with your uh, path in Windows to make it know where the JRE was and, the, and your, uh, your, your SDK was located? Um, a path in Windows is an environment variable. In Linux, they're also environment variables, and you can create all the ones you want, and you just use it, you create them using the export command. So if you want anything you, from one script to exist in another script, you export that variable, now it's available to the whole system, until you close that shell. Once you close the shell, then it's gone. But as long as that shell is active, the variables are available for your use. Um, 
And the last point's really important to realize. So script A exports a variable, then you run script B. If you change the value in script B, it's not going to affect what happened in script A because, well, obviously script A is done. That's what, that's what that line is trying to explain to you, that changes go down, they don't go backwards. So they're scoped to the currently running script. Uh, if you want to see all the variable values, you can run set. It'll output all the current shell values. If you have a copy of Linux running right now on your machine, knock yourself out, type in the set command, you'll see a big screen full of noise. But all your environment variables will be outputted. Um, if you use env, those are the environment variables that are exported by a script. So those are the ones that are local to your current session. Set shows you everything that's that's global to the whole computer plus your own. env just shows yours, your current sessions. Okay, so that was just noise, but that's what, you know, I had to cover it. Um, now, every once in a while you need to create a script that accepts parameter spaces. And, for example, there's a script called my script, and all it does is ls-l dollar sign one. So, what that's going to do is it's going to take the first argument of your script and then do a long listing of it. However, if you go my script space my space desktop, it's going to say no such desktop. I mean, no such file or directory, no such desktop, duh. No such file or directory because what's happened is there's a space in there, therefore it's treating as two separate arguments. So my becomes dollar sign one, desktop becomes dollar sign two. So how do you handle that? is you put your parameters in quote marks. However, that's still not going to fix it. Um, because if you go my script, my desktop is still going to say the same thing. Now, it's going to treat my desktop as a single argument. Yes. But when it outputs it to um, ls, it'll actually output it literal. In other words, it'll still be my space desktop. So you need to enclose inside the script your arguments in quote marks. So when you look at that line in the second box, third down, you'll see ls-l, the dollar sign one's in quote marks, as opposed to this one, which is not in quote marks. So the one with the argument inside quote marks will then respect the spaces properly. Cute tricks. Uh, Now, there's also grouping commands, and basically put it is, you want to run a bunch of commands all at once, one after another, and take the results as a single output. And if you use single brackets, it runs in a subshell. If you use curly brackets, it runs in the current shell. Now, do you guys understand the difference between a subshell and the current shell? It's a scope thing. You guys know about scope, right? It's variable scoping, function scoping in Java. You know, you create a variable inside of a function, it doesn't exist outside the function. When you create a subshell, what it does, it creates an isolated environment that mimics what you're in now. So it takes a copy of your current environment and makes a snapshot of it, and then it runs your commands inside of that. So it's like a sandbox. Now, if I had a Mac user in here, they'd know all about sandbox, uh, since that's a big feature of the Mac OS, is sandboxing. Uh, but essentially what's happening is when you create a subshell, it actually creates another copy of your current shell, runs the commands inside of that, and then it terminates the subshell. So it's like you're calling a function, stuff happens inside that function, then it gets discarded at the end because it returns void. It's the same idea. On the other hand, if you use the curlies, what it does is it'll run in your current shell, so any changes you do to the environment will stick. If you run it in the subshell, the changes to the environment don't stick because the, the shell gets discarded once the code is done. But when it's run in the current shell, any changes you do are permanent to your, sh your shell until you exit your session. Um, but I'm sure that was clear as mud. I just don't know how much better to explain the difference between subshell and not subshell. Um, 
Other than drawing a box on the screen, on the board, actually. I had to think about it. Okay, you know the, the ones, those of you that had the problem with the SU, okay, going into root, then going to the user, going into the root? So, the currently is running your current shell, this is your current shell that you're running in. When you run it as a subshell, in other words, what it does is it creates an environment inside of this, and everything that happens in here stays in here. This is like Las Vegas, right? When you leave Las Vegas, it's like nothing ever happened. Well, except for criminal records, but, you know, this never happened. Um, so... If you run it with the round parentheses, it does stuff inside this, then it deletes it, and it's like it never even happened. But if you do it with the curlies, whatever you did sticks around. And, oh, my script goes off the screen. Great. Um, if any of you feel like experimenting, you can actually experiment with that script in your uh, shell. All right. Now... Now I'm going to get to the meat and potatoes of the lecture. This was just errata that I had to, I was required to cover. Um, understanding loop theory. There used to be four slides here that explained to you what a loop was. Like what a for loop is and what a while loop is. Uh, obviously this course was originally designed for level one students. Um, you guys are level two. I sure as heck hope you know what a loop is and how they behave. Now I'm going to talk about syntax differences because the syntax differences are pretty pronounced. Okay. The first one I'm going to talk about is while. While is the best behaved looped in bash scripting. And it looks a lot like um, a while loop you'd find in basic or Fortran or Pascal. It doesn't look like a while statement you guys are used to at all. Well, it still acts the same, but it's not quite what you're used to seeing. So while a condition, you do the following commands, and it's going to do everything between do and done. In other words, it's going to keep looping everything inside the do statement until it hits done, and then, you know, if the condition's still not, while the condition is still true, it'll keep doing it. Just like a normal f while loop. So... Those of you that have worked on Lab 9, or finished Lab 9, this looks familiar. If you haven't done Lab 9, this doesn't look as familiar. Um, so this is a loop that basically constantly prompts a person to whether or not they want to stop. And essentially, unless you say yes, it'll just keep going. And it has to be lowercase yes in this case. So. It initializes the variable to n. It says while stop is not equal to yes. It's going to do. It outputs who you are. It outputs a file listing. And then it reads a prompt saying, do you want to stop, yes or no? And feeds the value into stop. <coughs> the next statement is done, which says this is the end of the loop, where the loop ends. And unless stop is equal to yes, it will just keep going. And if you say anything but uh, I mean, if you hit yes, it stops. If you say anything but yes, it keeps going. The syntax is different from Java because what's the big difference between this and the Java version? Anybody can spot the big difference? Come on. In Java, what would you have here and here instead? Yeah, there's no curly braces. It doesn't use curly braces for the loops. And one of the things I've noticed is over the years of teaching this particular chunk is Java students tend to throw in the curly braces automatically. And then they wonder why they're firing off a subshell. Actually, though, actually, no. they wonder why they're running this in their current shell. So they suddenly go, while, blah, error. Oh, that's weird. Then they go, while, blah, and they throw in some curlies. And then they get this weird behavior and they don't know why. No curlies. Um, you can actually get to check the output of a result of a program. 
So it's saying while not copy file 1 to 2, or file x to file y. So as long as that copy does not succeed, it'll keep trying. If it, uh, if, if it doesn't work, it waits 10 seconds and it tries again. Waits 10 seconds and it tries again. This is great for uh, systems that have strange file locks on them, where you need to back up certain files and maybe the backup's running a little long so you can get this to keep checking whether or not you can actually make a copy of the, of the backup. Because if the file is occupied, you won't be able to move it. Stuff like that. And you'll be glad to see that everybody's favorite command is still around. Break. Because, there you go, right over here, break. You can do while true, which is like not a good idea, by the way. Um, I'm sure you guys have all experienced an infinite loop at least once so far in the last year. Um, what's the fun part of an infinite loop is that it never stops until you kill the program or it melts your CPU. Uh, in Java, that's not likely. Uh, if you write a C program with an infinite loop, there's a really good chance, depending on what's happening inside that loop, that you can overheat your machine. Um, you know, it used to be a fun gag we'd do to our programmers is I'd run a program on their computer and overheated their CPU and shut it down at random, just for, you know, pranks. April 1st coming. Things you can do if they leave their computer unlocked. Um, so while true is not always, it's not a good idea, but you can use it. So what's happened is this loop is going to run forever. And once the count is greater than three, then it'll break. Now, there's a logic issue in this example. Can anybody spot the logic issue? That one actually I, I, I did on purpose. It's not leftovers from another prof. There's something really important missing in this. Yeah. That's it. This will run forever because count's not incrementing. So it's saying once count is greater than or equal to greater than three, then break. But what's not down here? There's no increment. This will run forever. And uh, I've been promised to copy the exam by tomorrow. So if it's anything like last term's exam, there's probably going to be a question that talks about, you know, why is this program not work? We're not going to ask you to write a shell script by hand, but we may ask you, you know, what's wrong with this? Or what would be the output from this? So, you know, if you notice that the program is missing an increment, there probably isn't an output. All right, nested loops. I kept this slide in here for you guys to refer to. I think you know what a nested loop does. Did you guys learn about nested loops? Did you guys do nested loops in Java? You know, for i 1 to 10 inside of i, you go for j 1 to 10, and what? how high does the numbers get? How many times is it going to count to 10 if I do for i 1 to 10 and then for j 1 to 10 inside of it? Yeah, yeah, it's going to count to 10, 10 times, which is 100. 10 times 10, right, the number of loops. And every inner loop iterates completely for every outer loop. So the more loops you have, the worse it gets. It's a bit like when I was, oh yeah, you guys didn't have me for a database, but uh, when I talk about nested subqueries, where it does repeated calls to the database server, same idea. The heck? Hello? All right, there's a complete while loop example that's nested. So you have a, a working example. That one does work in its entirety. Uh, we even, I even took the time to fix the quote marks on it. You'll notice they're not the stupid smart quotes, they're actual real quote marks. You theoretically should be able to copy paste this into a script and run it. All right, one that you don't have, I don't know if Java has this, is until. So it's just a, a logic choice where one says, while this is true, do this. Or you could turn around and say, until this is true, do this. It does the exact same thing as a do, but it flips the conditional. So 
whereas while is always operating on whether or not the condition is true, until is always operating on the condition being false. It's an inverse loop. Um, but it does the exact same thing. It's just the, the condition's opposite. So some people will like using an until. For example, in lab nine, some people use a, a do. Do while prompt is not equal to quit. Some people will put in until prompt is equal to quit or Q. So loop, this depends how your brain's wired, right? That's all it is. It gives you an alter alternative choice. There. The other one was while stop not equal to true, this is until stop is equal to true. It's the exact same code. Just the logic check is slightly different. And normally, from my experience, there's about 20% of people that like using until as opposed to do. They're the cup half empty people. Actually, no, seriously. I've noticed the, people, the half empty people tend to be more into the uh, until pile, whereas the cup half full is the do people. Just your personality makes a difference on how you choose to write your code. But they do the exact same thing. Okay. Four. Now, for variable in list, do the following things. You guys are used to <coughs> um, one that looks a little more like the second one, uh, which is four. There's a chunk of math. In other words, i is equal to one, i less than or equal to ten, i plus plus. You guys are used to do a loop from one to ten, like that. Uh, again, no curlies. Do and done. That's that's what it uses instead of curlies. Now, for my var in two, four, six, and eight, this is something I know, and I really don't know. I don't know Java well enough to be able to say this one. Well, I know in PHP and Python and C sharp we have something called for each. For each lets you loop through an array. It's in other words, for each element in the array do the following thing. This is the equivalent to that. So for e for my var in this, you could actually feed a list of files instead of a series of numbers in here. So you can see, for each file inside this file list, do the following thing. And this one here is going uh, my var to the power of two, so two to the power of two, four to the power of two, and now we're square, we're doing squares. And that's what that is. So that's if you want to loop through a list of values. And if you had an array, you could loop through the array. Now here's the arithmetic one. It almost feels familiar. Almost. But it doesn't. It's just strange enough to, to feel uncomfortable. For i in and curlies, 0 dot dot 10 dot dot Two is going to say for i between one and ten, counting by twos. So it'll do zero, two, four, six. It's kind of literally going to count by twos. It's going to loop to ten, incrementing by two. So for the for the Java people, that would be no. I'm not going to declare any variables. That's probably not Java syntax, that's PHP syntax, but we're going to go with it. You'll get the point. So we're going to add 2 to i and loop by 2s. It's close enough probably to the Java syntax that you can derive the difference. And then we got the one that everybody's familiar with. For num equal 1, num is less or equal to 10, increment num. But Please note, there's something important about this loop that you may not notice. And I'm going to go to this side and point to the same thing. Right there. Double brackets. 
not single brackets. Anybody want to tell me why? It's double brackets as opposed to single brackets? Uh, no. What does double brackets do as opposed to single brackets in a shell script? No, single brackets is execute. Double brackets is calculation. So this is telling it, inside these brackets, we're going to do mathematical operations. But well, you weren't far. You just you flipped it. Um, just like here, we're doing the math here in double brackets on the inside of it also. In parentheses, I should say. Brackets are square. But the double parentheses tells it it's going to be mathematical operations happening on the inside. And then, but it's like the ones you guys are used to seeing in Java, more or less. It's just the syntax is a little different, but it's the closest to what you guys are used to seeing. Okay, that's loops. Uh, the important part of it is to remember, compared to what you guys are used to working with, is the do done business, as opposed to you know curly braces. And if you're going to use a for loop and you want to use the syntax you're used to using, ish, make sure you put in double parentheses. That's all. That's all there is to say about that stuff. Jesus, I got through that in half an hour. Don't mind me, I'm putting myself an edit mark on the board. I don't need to record the Jesus, I only took half an hour to do that. <laughs> uh, open. Yeah, these slides are long. It looks like there's a lot of slides in the slideshows, but the problem is that it's almost all examples. So examples aren't talking points per se. Okay. Functions. I hope you guys know what a function is in Java. You guys probably probably used to refer to them as methods more than functions, even though you declare them using function. But a function and a method is the same thing. They just, their purpose in life is slightly different, but it's the same thing. Just to review, in case people here don't remember what a function is, functions are self-contained blocks of code. They exist onto themselves. They can accept a value and they return a result. Um, functions can be reused. That's why you, you create functions. So you don't have the same chunk of code over and over and over again. And if you can reuse the code, that remove reduces redundancy. In other words, you're not duplicating the same code. And it allows for more modular code also. It means that you can break down the code into smaller chunks and reuse parts of it. Because code reuse is a good thing. If you have the same chunk of code in five different places and you find a bug, that means you've got to fix the bug in five different places. If you have it in a function, you need to fix it in one place. Okay. General format of a function in the shell. And you guys are going to be so thankful when you see this or you're looking at it now. Function, function name, parentheses, curly, and then your statements. That should look somewhat familiar. What's missing here for you guys is the uh, public, private, protected stuff because bash is not object oriented and it doesn't have a return type because bash scripts are typeless therefore what's the point of having a return type if the whole language is typeless now here's what's important function name is required obviously but not obviously anybody here familiar with javascript Anybody here play with JavaScript? Do you know about anonymous functions? You haven't learned about anonymous functions? PHP has them too, and so does Python. Java doesn't have it. C Sharp now does. What does an anonymous function look like? Just so you know. And it, it's going to hurt your brain. That's what an anonymous function looks like. It's a function that doesn't have a name. So then you can have a function inside a function. You can nest functions. 
without names. In bash scripting, the function name is required. That means we don't have anonymous functions. Function is always required. Now, you either have to have the word function or the parentheses or both. But you need to have, you can choose to either go function, my function, and then you call it, you call that function as uh, add to, for example. You can literally call it function space add to curly. Or you could go add to parentheses curly. Those are both valid function declarations. Or you can do it where it's more comfortable for all of us, which is function space add to parentheses curly. And your statements are inside your curlies. Uh, statements are any of the valid shell commands. Anything that you can write in a normal shell script, you can put in this. Um, you use a function by using its name, which is known as a function call. You guys should know what that is. Here's a couple of examples. Fully declared at the top, function display hello, parentheses, you know, brace, uh, curly, I mean, echo hello, close brace. Then if you run display hello, it'll output the word hello. This is your shell script version of hello world. Or you could choose to ignore the word function and just call it display hello instead. And it'll do the exact same thing. It'll work. Personally, I prefer that if you're going to do it, declare it using the function keyword. It's more visually identifiable what it is you're doing. It's a bit like when you guys were learning SQL. I don't know if your SQL prof asked you, because we can't force you, but asked you to write your SQL keywords in uppercase and, you know, Everything else gets to be mixed case, but your select would be uppercase, your from would be uppercase, your where would be uppercase. Why? Because it makes it easier to identify this, you know, the SQL keywords at a glance. Even though SQL is totally case insensitive, it doesn't care how you write it. It cares about white space, not up and down. Um, same thing with this idea. If you declare it with the word function in front of it, at least you know it's a function. Whereas you might be skimming through a lot of looks like spaghetti code and suddenly you're like, what the heck's this? Now, functions are a little different in a shell script than what you guys are used to. For example, you guys can basically have a function anywhere inside of your class, and you can call it from anywhere else inside your class, as long as it's contained inside the class. And of course, again, I don't know Java, but I'll go with PHP is this arrow output would call a function called output inside my current class. With shell scripts, it lends itself more to the old days, where uh, the, the days of Fortran, Basic, uh, Pascal, where you had to have your functions declared at the top of the code, because you cannot call something that doesn't exist yet, because scripts run top to bottom. So if you're on the third line of code and your function's at the end of the file, has it ever seen your function yet? No, that means they can't run it. That means you have to do all your function declarations at the top of the script file so that they're already loaded up in memory and the script knows that they exist. That's the first thing. Usually that's why it says usually you put them at the top. You can put them at the bottom, but they're going to be totally useless because you're never going to call them if they're at the bottom because you won't be able to call them. So functions are usually placed at the beginning of the script or prior to the function call. Once the function is called, the shell executes the statements inside the function. Just like it would in Java, you call the function, it runs what's inside the function. After the function's completed, shell returns control to the outer pro program, right? So it's scoped. What happens inside there happens, and then, you know, everything else leaves. If you call the function before it's defined, you're going to get a command not found. So if ever you're writing a, a shell script, and you go to call the function, and you get an error message that says command not found, that means you, you're calling the function before it's defined. That means you need to move your function to the top of the file. So, you have function test one, function test two. Now, function one is declared, function two is declared, and then you'll see it called test one. And as you'll notice, I'll point to this side too. 
What's missing? Right there. There's no brackets when I'm calling the function, the parentheses. So you guys, you know, you're used to calling a function in Java. You always have to include the parentheses. Otherwise, it thinks you're talking about a variable. In shell scripting, you don't call the function with parentheses. You call it without the parentheses. So it looks just like a variable. Uh, C-like language programmers absolutely hate this. Those of us that come from a language from, you know, non-C-like, we're used to this. Basic Pascal, COBOL, uh, no, not COBOL, COBOL's totally different, but it's roughly the same idea. Um, Fortran, they're all like this. You call the function without the brackets. Now this one will work because even though test two is, call, is, de, is called in test one and is declared after test one because I'm not running test one yet, it'll go into test one, then it'll go from test one to test two and out. But if I were to take this test one and put it here, it would shit the bed. If I put it up here, it would also shit the bed. Test one has to be at the end for this to work. Basically, every function you plan to call has to exist before you call the very first function that you're going to use. So any functions that are nested in other functions, any functions that are called out of other functions, all have to exist before the initial function call. Which leads me back to, you might as well declare all your functions at the top of your file. That way you know at least they're going to be there. Okay. Uh, when you're implementing functions, there's a few things you should avoid to avoid errors. Use the function or the braces. If you forget both, it's not going to work. Um, don't add parentheses after the name when you call the functions I just highlighted a moment ago. Um, you can create the functions in the shell. You can use an editor, whichever way. You can literally, you could, if you really want to experiment, you can actually declare a function at the command line. You can go function space, my function braces, uh, parentheses, curly. Keep typing in a bunch of commands. Close the last curly, and then you can actually literally run that function. You just type the command line. It'll actually interpret it. It stored it in memory, which is kind of cool. It gives you a real-time console where you can actually run code to experiment without. But then once it's declared in memory, you've got to quit out of your shell. Because then the function exists, it won't let you create it a second time. So you're better off having it in a script file. All right. You can pass values to a function. Values are positional. Now you guys are used to declaring your function arguments inside the curlies right here, right? Not the curlies, but the parentheses. Notice there's no variable names inside of this. When you literally call the function, it grabs a positional argument. So if I want to call the function called display it, I can go display it, and then I could say um, Dan Goudreau, and it would output Goudreau Dan. Without, you can feed it as many arguments as you want. It's like the ultimate overloaded function. Um, did you guys learn about a fun function overloading in Java? So you know how for every version of your function, you have to have basically have a function declare or do a function stub for it? At least that's how it is in C. So you know, let's say you have <coughs> a function called display it, and it takes one argument, two arguments, or three arguments. You have to have basically three versions of the function declared, right? And the interpreter or the compiler decides which one you're calling based on how many arguments you feed it. Well, with shell scripting, that's not how it works. It just takes arguments, just like you would at the command line. That means a single function can have zero arguments, 20 arguments, five arguments. It doesn't actually do argument checking. It's just dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three. And it just, whatever's passed in is in the order of what you typed in after. So it's a bit like when you're running a uh, command at the command prompt, you know, ls space dash l. Then if you go dash A, that's the second argument. So number one, number two. It treats function calls as if you're calling a command at the command line. So whatever arguments you feed it is what it's going to take. Um, that's a complete example of how to compare two numbers. 
So function called declare, uh, compare has some braces. And it's going to say if dollar sign is equal to dollar, dollar sign one, if argument one is equal to argument two, it's going to say one is equal to two. If one's greater than two, then it says greater than, otherwise it's assuming it's less than. And then when you do compare, you go one, two. So you're going to feed it arguments one, argument two into it. And in this case, argument one, argument two would be what would be coming from your command line. So you could literally type in a command called compare space five space six. Or in here, you could just type it in as compare five six. Both would work. And if you decide to shove this into your uh, into your Linux environment, make sure you change the quote marks because it's still using stupid smart quotes. So if I had a script called compare nums, 10, 5, it'll say 10 is greater than 5 because it'll take argument 1, argument 2, argument 1, argument 2. Then the function is declared while it's being run. And at the end, it'll take argument 1, argument 2 from the command line and pass it to the function, and the function does stuff with it. On the other hand, what is w different, though, is inside this function, number 1, number 2 is scoped to that function. It's not the number 1, number 2 on the outside of the function. It's its own copy of 1 and 2. 1 and 2 exists outside this outside outside here so this this one and two will exist for the the parent func uh, script this one and two only exists for inside the function so it gets a little weird because then number one dollar sign one gets reused multiple times and you don't get to give it a new name because it's argument position one not you know value one it's gross okay So this is a function that um, parses the contents of an ls statement. So and if an ls-l would give you this, um, then you have a function call, and you go echo file has l count of links. You can actually write a function that actually breaks apart the ls-l to give you just the pieces you care about if you wanted to have a fancy looking LS. So that would output, file one has one link and is 311 bytes long. So it'll take the full size LS, and since the output of LS is space delimited, right? One space, two space, three space, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces. Well, seven plus the, it, it treats it as a separate set of arguments. So argument one would be permissions, link, uh, owner, group, size, creation date, creation time, and the name of the file. That's our uh, nine arg or eight arguments coming from an ls-l. And that function takes it, breaks it apart as separate pieces, and then I can call those things. Ah, now, this highlights something else you might not have expected. Can you notice, for Java people, this should stand out. This is a, we're going to do a little logic test. How observant are you? So I've got my function. I just declared and set a bunch of variables inside the function. Now I'm using those variables outside the function. No, as in no, as in no, it's gross. No, it's scaring you. No, you don't know what's wrong. No, these become global. See, in Java, all these variables would be local to the function, right? They'd be scoped to the function. In a shell script, even if you declare variables inside of a function, they exist outside the function. All, all variables being created are global. There is a way to make it not global, but by default, all variables are global. Yeah, you prefix it with local. but. If you want a variable to be local, you have to actually tell it to be local. Otherwise, everything is global by default. So it's actually a little dangerous because there's always a risk of kiboshing a value from one function in another function if you say you use the same variable name by accident. You know, you go, you have one variable where you're looping on i. 
from I1 to 10. At the end of that loop, I is going to be 10, right? Then you go use while I is less than 10 in another function while I has already been set to 10. So because all the variables are global, there's danger of kiboshing values on both sides. Okay, variables do have scope. Scope is a boundary where the variable content can be accessed. You guys know about this. A global scope means it's everywhere. Local scope means it's only within the function. If you create a local variable, you cannot modify it outside the function. You guys know about that in Java. Right? You know about scoping variables. Um, so these are unscoped variables. X is 10, calls function, X, X becomes 5. It's still going to be 5 once it's done. However, if you want to make it a local variable, so in other words, inside your function, you want to make sure that variable is scoped just to the function, use a statement called local. And it looks like this. Like same script as before. X is equal to 10. This will be equal to X. It calls a function. X becomes 5. It'll output 5. But if you do it here, it'll still be 10. So now you've managed to separate X as two separate variables, one that's scoped and one that's not. Magic. Uh, a lot of the logical bugs in, in shell scripts come from this kind of stuff, where you don't realize your variables are global all the time. Um, just picture this way: it having a fun creating declaring functions in um, in a shell script is like having a completely unlocked Facebook profile. Everybody can see everything you put in it, whether you want them to or not. So, if you think of variables like that in shell script, you'll feel you'll be just fine. Okay, return status of a function. You can use a command called return to return function status. And the function, the syntax is return n. Sounds familiar, right? You return a value out of your Java program. You can return a value out of your shell script. Uh, except this case, it can't be anything but a number. 0 through 255. Normally, 0 means it worked. 1 means it failed. It's like a double negative. Right, we're used to thinking of one is true, zero is false. This one is, hey, it didn't go wrong. Return zero, it didn't go wrong. Return one, something went wrong. You're flipping the logic. And it looks like this. So in the function, we can actually return part way through by returning a zero or a one. True, false. 99% uh, of the time, all you're ever going to use is Boolean values. One or zero, zero, one. So you can call if file exists one, and if it returns a zero, then it was successful. If it returns one, it's not successful. Sounds weird, but you know, it's the logic of that. Um, you can actually export functions. So let's say you have a shell script that actually defines a bunch of functions that you want to use in more than one place. You can actually define all your functions and export them. So then they become functions available to the entire uh, shell script, uh, the shell environment. So imagine if you had a Java program, and I'm sure some of you wish you could do this. You wrote a Java program where you created a function that you really like, and then you say, export this function. And then you can go to, to the command prompt and actually run just the function and actually run it while Java's not running. So essentially what it does, it takes that whole function, exports it, and it treats it as a command. So you've now created a new command that you can use the command with any other script as long as your function as long as you're within the current you know shell environment it'll run so if there's certain things you like to do on a regular basis like updating uh one one shell script that I have that's similar to this when I log into one of our web servers it's a function that updates the source code on the web app and cuz there it's a multi-step process right I connect to the database put it in maintenance mode do a subversion update run a script that updates the database structure if there's changes to the database, update the database version, take it out of maintenance mode. And if you forget one step, 
you know, something's going to go wrong. So I have a bash script that I literally log into, I log into the machine because I log in as root for permission reasons. I log in as root and I literally I'll go uh, update subscription service, enter. Then I just walk away and it's going to do all the whole job, everything I needed it to do. So instead of me having to remember every step, part of my batch login routine is it actually declares this function so it's always there available for me. And it's not a, um, it's not a shell script contained on the command line, it's literally in my environment. So it doesn't need to be anywhere in my path because it's always available as long as I'm logged in. It's a cute trick. And there is a function hi, there it is. Now, I'm ex exporting a subshell here, trying to run it, but if I export it, that becomes available. It's an example of what it would look like if you were to do it at the command line. <sighs> I need a drink. It's only water. Everybody's favorite topic, arrays. And yes, by now, I hope to God you've had arrays in Java. Because when I was teaching database, I like to use referring to arrays when I refer to certain things, and it doesn't really float because a lot of people have never seen arrays. So understanding arrays. An array is a list. It's a variable that contains a series of elements. Surprise. You can refer to an element using a subscript. Subscripts are created when the array is created. They always start with zero. This should sound familiar. Zero-based arrays. So how do you declare an array? Single parentheses. Food is equal, parentheses. Sandwich, chick, I guess it's supposed to be chicken. Uh, spinach, lettuce, and apple. Close parentheses. And then I can go echo curlies food for. And it'll output apple because apple is element number four because it starts at zero. So sandwich is zero, chicken is one, spinach is two, lettuce is three, apple is four. So if I go echo food four with this nice special syntax, it'll output apple. So you can work with arrays. So you guys should know when to use an array because you've learned it. Um, you use an array when you have values of similar nature. So a list of files, you know, a series of permissions, a list of users, you know, things that are similar. And you can refer to all the data by referencing the whole variable in one go. Or you can refer to a single element by using the subscript value. Unlike Java where you can say, once you've declared something as an array, you can't treat it as a string. Uh, in a shell script, you can treat it like a string. So you can just go echo space the name of the array, it'll output the whole contents of the array. So if you don't use the curlies and then with the subscript, so you know, array four, and say you just go output the name of the array, it'll output the entire array for you in one go without even hiccuping. Um, the only variable you have to declare in bash scripting, using the declare command. So you go declare dash a car. Now car is now an array. If you just went car, then it wouldn't be an array. Um, and before, you know, uh, if you use the syntax like that, it creates the array on the fly. Um, something Python, PHP, and Bash scripters all have in common that we all enjoy. We can declare variable, we can declare arrays without actually needing to call it an array. It just becomes an array. So if you go name index equals value, it'll go, hey, name is being given an index value. I guess I'll treat this as an array. Congratulations, name is now an array. It's very fluid. And to assign values to an array, there's an example right there. Car zero is a Crown Vic. Car one is a caravan. Or you can also go car is equal to a list of values. Notice they're not common delimited. They're space delimited. 
If you want to have spaces in your values, you have to put everything in quote marks. The joy. Or we can append. Car plus equal Tesla. So we're going to add a Tesla to our list of shitty cars. Right? We've got a Crown Vic, a Caravan, and a Buick, and then we're going to throw a Tesla in there with them. And that just appends Tesla to the array. It's like magic. Elements can be numbers also. So it doesn't have to be strings. You can put in numbers. Nine, you know, a bunch of grades, and there it is. You can list the grades using the same syntax. And I already displayed an example of that earlier. If you want to output the contents of the fifth element, dollar sign Curly's food five, it'll give you the fifth. And you can assign it to a variable also, obviously, just like you can in Java. It's just syntax a little different. Now, braces are important. Because if you don't use the curly braces, it treats it as a weird function call, a variable call. So you go echo food four, it'll echo sandwich bracket four. But if you go echo dollar sign curly's food four, then it'll output apple. It's just the way it works. And you can shift your array. Do you guys learn about shifting arrays in Java? No? Okay. So you learn how to loop through an array, right? Probably you guys learn how to do four, uh, using a for loop to loop through an array for i equal one to length of the array. Um, there is actually more efficient ways of doing it, and it's called pushing and popping an array. Um, it's also known as shifting it. And what happens is when you push and pop, you're pushing values onto the array. You're popping a value off the array. When you're shifting is you're moving the window of the array. So for example, if you go food one, it's actually looking at element number one, which if I remember it, it was chicken. But if you go food one plus two, it's actually going to look at element number three, which if I remember top of my head, that was lettuce. If you're going to go element 5 minus 1, it's actually going to look at 4. So you can actually do the math and slide the window back and forth using mathematical operators. Now, you're thinking, well, what's good is that? The next line you look at, t is equal to 3. So let's just say you got a function where you're not sure, um, you don't need the entire array, but you want one element of the array, and you know it's element 4 all the time. This allows you to actually shift your array to be, you know, one-based. In other words, whatever value you give it, it's always plus one. So food t plus one means it will give you apple, which basically it's doing the math based on the variable. Um, you can do roughly the same thing in Java. You can do the math. It's just inside when you call the array element, you can actually do the math to figure out what array element you want. Um, but if you didn't know what that, that technique is called, it's called shifting. Shifting or sliding, depending on who you ask, but it's shifting your array based on a positional argument. Um, if you want to know how many array elements you have, awesome syntax. By awesome, I mean it's terrible. You guys are probably used to, I don't know what it is in Java, but I know in PHP it's called count. There's also one called size of. Essentially, you can go size of, feed it an array, and it tells you there's how many, this X number of array elements. With bash scripting, um, there's two things. If you want to refer to all the array elements, it's star. So you're going to do something to all the array elements. So if you go echo food star, it'll output each of the elements one at a time inside of it. If I go echo dollar sign brace pound or hash mark, depending what you want to call it, array name asterisk, they'll tell you how many array elements you have. It's such an obvious command, and it's not obvious. Uh, but basically, the pound sign, which is right there, 
I'm sure the people on this side of the room, right over there, is the equivalent of doing a count on your array elements. So you know how many array elements you have by literally prefixing your array name with a pound sign. And there's a quick example. Um, so this one here is checking to see if array element number two exists. Uh, so it'll tell you whether or not there's something there. Um, you can use the read statement with an array, um, which is cool. So what you end up doing is you feed it a syntax that tells it you can put it in a loop and you just keep looping and feeding it a a variable inside the bracket. So it'll just keep going entries one, two, three, four, five. And then once you've hit your total number of entries, the loop stops. But you can actually input into an array. So for those of you that are doing lab eight, in theory, you could use a four element array to, to keep your grades. You know, you could have element zero being the assignments, element one being test one, element two being test two, element three being uh, the exam. And then you could actually loop through the array to do the math. Instead of going, you know, variable 1 plus variable 2 plus variable 3 plus variable th 4, you could just literally loop through the array and do the math that way. It's just different ways of doing the same thing. Okay. So, literally, that was what was left of the content. Um, like I said before, what I'm going to be doing going forward next week, because they haven't told me if they were giving up my class or not. So remember I was discussing last week that I might be giving up next week to, to Dave. They didn't get back to me, so I'm guessing that he's not using my class. Uh, if he is, I'm going to send out an <laughs> announcement, but I haven't heard peep about it. Um, barring that, I'll be here next week. So if you're having problems with your uh, labs, 8, 9, and 10, I can give you a hand. Or if you want to demo 8, 9, and 10 in class and skip labs, that works also. Uh, the week before the exam, which your exam date should be showing on Access now, um, will be a quick review. In other words, I'll be going through the last of the uh, um, how much of each things there are. Um, I do know there's 80 questions on the exam last time I heard. So it's not a huge exam, but it's 80 questions on the exam. Um, what room does Access say your exam's in? Anybody can tell me? Because it's not showing up on mine yet, and it's supposed to. So it's either going to be C142 or the gym. C144? Oh, hot damn, I did get the room to myself. So you guys are going to be by yourselves with me and one invigilator. You're not going to be in the gym with the other three sections. So it'll be a slightly quieter environment for everybody's enjoyment. Uh, I prefer separating my guys out from the rest of the group. It's less noise and less stressful than listening to, you know, 360 other students panicking. Not that there's anything worth panicking over, but, you know, it's better than listening to everybody panic. Um, so that's that. I, like, I'll be spending the rest of the class obviously sitting here if anybody wants to get signed off on their labs. And then otherwise I'll be going upstairs at 7 to continue signing off labs. Other than that, it's been fun, guys, and I'll see you guys at review if you don't come next week. Yes, it's multiple guest scantron. So you don't need to write code. You don't need to write any words. You just have to know how to guess. And no, there isn't a predominant letter, as far as I can see. I got the answer key. There's not a single. I do have the answer. I don't have the exam, but I got the answer key. No. Uh, but I did skim it really quick to see if one letter stood out more than others. And no, there is not a single letter in there that will get you a guaranteed pass. Because, you know, there's some people that there's a, there's a piece of logic that says B is the most common letter you'll find on a multiple choice test. Not this one. Uh, the 
it's where I look at data for a living. You know, I can't help myself. I, I, look, at I look at stuff like that for me, and it's an automatic, um, let's take a look at this and see if there's a pattern in this before I go any further. 